Hi, this is Jack Stanley, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the War of the Speeds. I'm sure many of you are aware of the fact that uh, at one time we had a war going on between 33, 45, and 78 RPM records, and even for a short while, uh, for children's records and for extended play records, there were 16 RPM records. You won't see these very often on machines anymore, but at one point, uh, you could, you could get uh, 16 RPM records. Now, the thing is, I remember when I was a little boy, I had something called a Bing Crosby jukebox, and it played 78 RPM records, and my kitty records were multicolored. They were yellow and, I think, blue and not many that were black, actually. They were yellow and blue and green and stuff like that. And I played them all on my Bing Crosby jukebox. 78 was not a foreign thing to me because, well, when I was a little kid, 78s were still around here and there. Got to remember, 78 RPM records were made until the 1960s. So, <clears throat> the thing is that I had my 78s. I also had another phonograph where I played 45s and 33s and 16s. I had 16 RPM records, I had 33 RPM records, and I had 45 RPM records. In fact, I had every speed that was available at the time. And it was normal. I mean, we didn't look upon it as odd stuff. It's it's interesting today because the age of records have long since passed and people really don't understand what they were. But for those of us who got involved in collecting recordings, it wasn't such a foreign thing because we had lived through it. We had seen a lot of this stuff and uh, a lot of us had these recordings. I don't know whatever happened to my Bing Crosby jukebox. I remember it. It was a little worse for wear by the time I had it. I don't think it was mine originally. It might have been my father's, perhaps. I don't know. But the thing is that uh, I played with that for a while, and then I had my, my recordings. Now, here's the fun thing about the recordings that I always enjoyed. and I had the Chipmunks on record, and you know, on a 33 RPM record, you change the speed to 16, and then you play the chipmunks, and you hear them more or less as they recorded it, which was dreadful. But they had to do it in that way to make sure you could understand it. Christmas, Christmas. And they overemphasized everything. But nonetheless, <clears throat> records were an important part of our lives, and every speed was there. And there was a battle for a long while as to what would be the long play record. One has to remember that Columbia had pushed out the 33 RPM long play record. RCA Victor had pushed for the long play 45 RPM record. And, of course, both of them, along with a lot of other smaller companies, were still producing 78 RPM records. I can't remember. Actually, I think in India, they were pressing 78 RPM records of the Beatles. Gives you an idea, you know, how, how long they produced them. But nonetheless, there was a long time before you knew which one was going to win. I remember as a little boy going into the record store, which a record store was a big deal years ago, and you would see many of the RCA records were uh, on 45 RPM, and Columbia was on LP. And when Columbia started doing 45 RPM records, they had a slot that went into the big hole for the 45 RPM record that you had to pop out. Therefore, it would basically play like an LP record with a small spindle hole. RCA, of course, had to cross-license with Columbia to make their LP records, which they did. And so it was, uh, once again, it was as it had been for many, many years in the recording industry, an uneasy truce, which they kind of helped each other out. 
I do remember also that, and I'm sure many collectors do, that long play records were not brand new in 1948 when they were introduced by Columbia. Uh, Goldmark, I believe his name was, Peter Goldmark, developed the Micro Groove uh, 33 RPM record. Um, but the thing is that uh, RCA Victor, in the early 1930s, came out with a long play record. Before that, you had Thomas Edison, Inc., came out with their long play record. In both cases, it was pretty much a disaster. And there's reasons for that. The first recording put out by RCA as a long play record was a demonstration uh, hosted by Frank Crummett. And it was recorded live onto disc. Every other recording afterward, without possibly there's a few exceptions to this, were transcriptions taken from normal 78 RPM records. And it was somewhat of a dismal failure. It was a it was a dubbed copy of a 78, so it was no big deal. Same thing happened with Edison uh, in the 1920s when they decided to make their long play records, which was a very interesting affair. I remember finding a drawing of how they did it. They had two separate horns uh, to record from different standard 80 RPM disc records. And they would switch back and forth from the horns and cut onto the long play record, which often got screwed up because they had a very, very tightly grooved 10 and 12 inch Edison diamond disc with uh, grooves that were somewhat around 400 grooves per inch, if I recall correctly. Now, the thing is that it's very hard to, uh, to make a 400 groove per inch record work. One thing that was very difficult, you got to remember, you were transferring acoustic recordings acoustically and recording acoustically upon the long play record. It was a disaster. So, and RCA was somewhat of a disaster as well in their long play uh, records. And it wasn't until Columbia made those uh, 33 RPM recordings that it actually made some sense and it became the standard. The 45 RPM almost led to the death of RCA because they had put everything into it. And it turned out that the 45 RPM was perfect for jukeboxes and perfect for singles and for hits. And it became the de facto 78. It basically took the place of the 78 record. And so the 78 was pretty much gone by the late 1950s, although they were available for years afterwards. I remember being in school and we used 78 records. I remember I had 70 record, 78 records as a kid, as I mentioned. So 78s died slowly. They didn't disappear that quickly. It's just kind of interesting when we think about all these different types of records in the War of the Speeds. And when you had a new phonograph, stereo, well, it wasn't really stereo initially, but mono and then stereo machines, uh, you had to have 16, 33, 45, and 78 so you could play all of the various records that were available at the time. Nowadays we have CDs, and now even CDs are looked upon as somewhat archaic because now you have everything downloaded in the way of music, which, to be perfectly honest, I get a little confused with. But there again... I'll go back to my Bing Crosby jukebox, or I will go back to a nice cylinder or disc record, and I'm comfortable. With some of the new technology, I'm kind of left in the dark, but uh, I'm fascinated by it and always learning from it. But there's an interesting thing that I have noticed with our new downloadable software of music, that there was a great striving in the 1960s and 70s with LPs to come up with the finest fidelity possible. And I've noticed that fidelity has gone downhill a little bit. In fact, if you think about these downloadable recordings, the quality is nothing like the LPs of the 70s. But 